Let me read to you a passage from the 12th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 49 to 53. It's the Gospel for the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time Year C. I shall only read part of it. St. Luke writes, Jesus said to his disciples, I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. There is a baptism with which I must be baptized, and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. That's part of Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. And what does it suggest to us? Well, one of the most striking features of human history and society is the constant recurrence of war and strife. Now, inasmuch as man has a profound need for, for society and for relationships with others, one would have thought that human history would have been distinguished by peace and concord. Of course, this is indeed how things ought to have been, but due to man's original fall, it is not so. And so obvious and notable is this fact that many general histories have been written from the perspective of the ebb and flow of wars. Peace is man's need, but it is constantly elusive. You know, I remember when the Berlin Wall fell and the communist countries of Russia and Eastern Europe began to crumble. Everyone hoped for a transformation of the Cold War into a new era of peace. But suddenly, out of nowhere, began the era of Islamic terrorism. And nothing seemed able to stop it from growing. Peace seems to be constantly escaping our grasp. There has been a view of Jesus Christ which looks on him simply as a man of peace. He was a peacemaker and required of his followers that they be makers of peace. Well, of course, this is perfectly correct, if properly understood. After all, our Lord solemnly tells his disciples that blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. <clears throat> Throughout Christian history, there have been countless examples of holy Christians who, out of love for Christ, have distinguished themselves by their sowing of peace and replacing strife with concord. But these holy builders of the peace of Christ did not see themselves as keeping just any kind of peace in the sense of avoiding all conflict. Nazism grew in Germany in the 1920s because many persons were not vigilant and others just wanted to avoid difficulty, and thus Nazism was allowed to gain power. There is an old saying which states that evil flourishes when good people do nothing. Doing little in the face of evil and human need does not safeguard the peace that God desires for the world. The peace Christ came to bring involves conflict with what the Christian tradition has identified as the values of the world, the flesh and the devil. It involves courageous and persevering struggle for the truth. Our Lord proclaimed the obligation to build peace, but look at what happened in his own life and ministry. One might say, if only he had said nothing, things would have been more peaceful for him. If only he had remained in Nazareth and let things be. Instead, he aroused great opposition from the religious leaders and division of opinion about him among the people because of his bearing witness to the truth above all about himself. His claims and his doctrine led to his rejection and death. Our Lord, in this sense, caused strife. Indeed, in our Gospel today, our Lord, having told his disciples in a much earlier chapter that they were to be builders of peace. He now tells them that I have come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were already blazing. He asks, do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, a household of five will be divided, three against two and two against three. A father will be divided against his son and a son against his father. The division was caused by his proclamation of the truth. At the beginning of our Lord's life, 
when he was presented in the temple, the holy Simeon took the child Jesus into his arms and solemnly foretold that he would be a sign of contradiction and that many would rise and fall because of him. Furthermore, a sword would pierce the soul of the Virgin Mary, the first and greatest Christian. That is to say, being a true Christian and witnessing to Christ and his truth in the world will not be easy. It will bring contradiction and division. In his meeting with Pilate, our Lord defined his life's mission as bearing witness to the truth. Those who love the truth listen to his voice. There we have the key to that true peace on earth, which the mission of the Christian is to build and promise and to promote. The key is Christ and his truth. The path to peace lies in embracing and living in Jesus and in his truth and in bearing witness to it before others, even if in doing so one becomes a sign of contradiction. Of course, putting this great key into practice is a complex daily challenge, but one at least must understand what that key is. The key lies in knowing and putting into practice the truth revealed by Jesus. The world needs Christ, and the layperson must bring this message to the world of his everyday life. The Church, in her social and moral teaching, spells out what this means in practical detail, and it is incumbent on the layperson to try to gain an adequate knowledge, an adequate knowledge of this teaching, so as to know what the truth of Christ really entails for life and society. He must know the Church's teaching and must accept that it will involve the cross and contradiction. How many Catholics who are in politics stand up for what the Church firm, firmly and clearly teaches as being the truth of Christ? Well, a small minority, not the majority. Let that sad fact be a great reminder for all members of Christ's faithful that the danger lies in doing nothing while evil grows. The true peace God intends requires a great struggle and will involve the cross and various forms of rejection. But the true Christian is prepared to carry that cross in the footsteps of Jesus. Let us then take to heart our Lord's words in the Gospel I read earlier and be prepared for what it takes to follow him wherever his providence places us in life.